standard equipment. The National Highway Transportation Safety Board voted 5 to nothing today to make the recommendation to the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration. More on these stories available at townhall.com. Come to Angelo's and Finchie's Restaurante to see memorabilia of movie stars and theatrical magic right in downtown Fullerton, California. The art of the great masters in an Italian town square complete with storefronts of old. Italian butchers and cheesemongers, fruit and wine vendors, seamstresses showing their wares. The romance of Romeo and Juliet. Find our mystical room of the moon and don't forget King Kong, Dracula, Frankenstein and who knows what awaits you in the wine cellar. Enjoy the great food. We hand stuff our pastas, roll each and every tortellini, bake our own bread and make all of our sauces fresh from our private stock of Sicilian family recipes. Pasta to seafood, chicken to award-winning pizzas, tiramisu flowing in from Rome. If you can't find something on our menu to tempt you, you don't like Italian food. Try our Sunday brunch, all you can eat, just $21.95. And Angelo's and Vinci's has been named the best Italian restaurant in Orange County two years in a row, and our owner has been named Restaurant Tour of the Year. Angelo's and Vinci's, Fullerton, California, 714-879-4022 or angelosandvinci's.com. Hi, this is Ron Seggi inviting you to join me for The Tonight Show of Radio every Saturday night, 9 to 11 Pacific Standard Time on CRN Digital Talk Radio. Now in our 24th year and well over 19,000 guests, The Ron Seggi Show Live originates from our Universal Radio Studios. Celebrities from TV, music, movies, literature, politics, and show business, at one time or another, they all come to The Ron Seggi Show. So why don't you? Welcome, welcome, welcome. It is time for the Legal Lounge. It's time for Richard Nixon Live, CRN Digital Talk Radio, streaming coast to coast and broadcasting around the world on CRNTalk.com. We are so happy to be joined by one Mr. Richard Nixon. He's a practicing attorney. He's a Bachelor of Science in Physics, Doctorate of Law, and uh, he's a constitutional scholar and author of America, An Illusion of Freedom, a fantastic book available on Amazon.com, Barnes & Noble, and as well in iTunes. we got a big show today, Richard, but first of all, sir, how are you? I'm fine, and thank you for that great introduction. My pleasure. That's the way I do it. We're going to talk uh, today. It's all about the Benjamins, you guys. We're going to talk about the Commerce Clause, the Tax and Spend Clause, and we're going to have a case that relates to both of those, a case that absolutely blows my mind every time I hear about it. And you're going to know why once we describe it. Wickard versus Fulborn. It's an amazing case from 1942. But we would be remiss to uh, not mention that today is September 11th. It's the 17th anniversary of the terrorist attacks, devastating terrorist attacks in uh, New York, Washington, and Shanksville, Pennsylvania. And uh, I always like to, I don't like to, but I think it's, it's appropriate to just mention, you know, our thoughts and our prayers to all the victims' families of that tra tragic event. And like Richard, we were talking. Absolutely. You know, it was just, I uh, can't believe it, 17 years ago. What are your recollections about that day? I was just talking to a friend of mine today, and like everybody else, I was, for some reason, working uh, and happened to catch a glimpse of the TV and I thought it was simply a movie or some type until I, f I saw that uh, the news had got into it and explained that it wasn't, it was real. Yeah, so, yeah, it was just amazing. I remember I was I was staying uh, with uh, my grandfather at the time. It was pretty elderly, and I was kind of taking care of him. And we were both just, you know, it was myself and him. And he's lived through, you know, Pearl Harbor. He's lived through all these, you know, amazingly historic events, tragic events, and historical events. And just to have his uh, experience, and you know, it shook him up, you know, just as much as it shook anybody else up. He he really he was the first person I saw who said that it, it equated to. Uh, to Pearl Harbor and so you know all of our thoughts and prayers to all the victims families out there and just a, a, a terrible terrible day and, and maybe a future show we'll talk about the legal yes, the, the legal implications of a uh, of that day and what happened afterwards and so just briefly before we hit the first break Richard uh, what are we talking about today well we're going to talk about the tax and spend clause and the 
Commerce Clause. Uh, I'd like to discuss them together because for some reason the cases uh, discuss these two um, powers that were given to Congress. And of course we're going to discuss how they, along with the other uh, cases we've talked about, the Due Process Clause and the Equal Protection Clause, um, <clears throat> the Commerce Clause and Tax and Spend Clause have also been rewritten and expanded in terms of the power given to Congress. Absolutely. We're going to get into it, you guys. Uh, give us a call, 818-818-6401. That's 818-818-6401 with any comments, questions, or concerns. This is the Legal Lounge. Richard Nixon live here on CRN Digital Talk Radio, broadcasting coast to coast and around the world. Make sure to check out his book, America, An Illusion of Freedom, available on Amazon.com, Barnes & Noble, and iTunes. Check out Richard's personal website as well, www.pres37th.com. WIX.com slash America. We'll be right back in one hot minute. Hi, everyone. This is Fred Dreyer. You listen to me every week on the Sports Lounge. Well, I'm here to tell you my good friend and co host, Michael Horn is making his wine knowledge and his incredible industry contacts available to you. Mike will educate you in the world of wines. He will stock your wine cellar, wine refrigerator, or wine rack with one-of-a-kind wines. Also, as a lover of a great glass of port, I will share with you my experiences in finding the cigars that fit your palate. I will help you stock your humidor with great cigars that reflect your growing taste and the very best smokes for your budget. Mike and I can set up a once-in-a-lifetime wine dinner, and I can host a sports cigar party. Call us today at 818-818-6400. That's 818-818-6400. Let us find the dream wines and cigars of your lifetime. Richard Nixon live in the Legal Lounge, streaming live at CRN Digital Talk Radio, crntalk.com. You're so happy to be joined by Richard Nixon. He's a practicing attorney and author, America, an Illusion of Freedom. And so let's kick things off here. We're going to go deep, deep, deep onto Article 1 of the United States Constitution, Section 8, which uh, is all about the Benjamins. We're going to start off with Article 1, Section 8, Clause 1, the Tax and Spending Clause. Can you give our, uh, our listeners a brief, brief background about that? Yes. Um, of course, the, this goes back to the original Constitution, 1789. Uh, Section 8 of Article 1 basically says that Congress shall have the power to lay and collect taxes to pay the debts and provide for the common defense and general welfare of the United States, and that all the taxes must be uniform throughout the United States. Now, we're not going to get into the uniformity here today, but what, we're, what this basically says is that Congress can lay and collect taxes for two purposes. One, to provide for the common defense, and two, for the general welfare. And we'll, we'll be discussing how Congress has extended that authority way beyond what was permitted there. And uh, just on my cursory research here, Richard, the general welfare, that term right there is open to a wide interpretation going back to the founding fathers themselves. I believe that Thomas Jefferson had a, a very interesting view about the general welfare and about the clause itself. Yes, uh, Thomas Jefferson basically said that, um, well, what did he say? He basically said that um, um, if you you must look at the um, you must look at Article One, Section Eight, Clause One, as comprising two parts. One is the power to tax, and the purpose for which it was taxed is to 
provide for the common defense and general welfare. And it was never intended that the purpose of the tax was to was an additional power granted to the federal government. That is to say, we have a list of 17 things in Article 1, Section 8. This was intended to be consistent with the other, if you will, in this case, 16 powers. It was not an additional grant of power. And therefore, as, as uh, Thomas Jefferson said, if, if you were to construe uh, Article 1, Section 8, Clause 1, granting additional power to the Congress to provide for the common defense and general welfare, then there would be really be no need, since Congress could be defining general welfare, to enumerate the other 16 powers. You would re essentially, uh, essentially you would render the other powers redundant. Uh, so why not simply say Congress can do, they can tax for anything that they think is good to do for the general welfare. And that would be the end of it. Yeah, the example that you gave me before the show, which really illuminated it for me, is that for the enumerated powers and the general, uh, the general welfare language is that, you know, you have 17 rules that your parents said, hey, these, these 17 rules, you don't break these rules, but hey, you can do whatever you want. Yes, exactly. And there's two other founding fathers that had interesting perspectives on the, uh, what you know, constitutes and connotes the language of the general welfare is that James Madison, he uh, advocated in the ratification of the Constitution in the Federalist Papers that uh, asserting that spending must tangentially be tied to one of the other specifically enumerated powers, those powers that you just talked about, Richard, such as regulating interstate or foreign commerce or providing for the military uh, as the general welfare clause is not a specific grant of power but a statement of purpose qualifying the power to tax. Alexander Hamilton, and I think it should be noted that he said yes. this after the Constitution was ratified, that only the Constitution, after it's been ratified, he argued for a broad interpretation which viewed spending as an enumerated power Congress can ex exercise independently to, quote, benefit the general welfare, such as the as asset national needs to an agricultural and an education. And so my question to you, Richard, is who, who decides what's, uh, what, what is the general welfare? Well, see, that's the problem that uh, Congress was defining it, and the Supreme Court was okaying it, basically. Uh, and again, if we use classical logic as opposed to Orwellian logic, uh, Jefferson, who was opposed to, uh, opposed by Adams, Hamilton, and even uh, George Washington, and Chief Justice Marshall in the uh, Marbury versus Madison case, uh, I'm a I think that Thomas Jefferson's argument is the, the more cogent of the two because he simply says, if, like you said, Mike, if you're going to grant 17 explicit powers to the Congress, but then you're going to say, well, by the way, you can do whatever you want to do if it will help the uh, general welfare, then you've just made those other 17 things redundant or surplusage. And in previous uh, sessions, Mike, we've talked about the fact that uh, lawyers and judges and justices do not interpret uh, documents, any kind of legal document, uh, and construe it as casting aside certain words. We always, we assume that the legislature said what it meant and meant what it says, and therefore we must account for every word. If we were to adopt the non-Jefferson view, then we might, we might, we all we need is one. Uh, Article 1, Section 8, Clause 1 would answer everything. It would simply say Congress can do whatever it thinks it's proper for Congress to do, whatever it thinks it's good. And there's, this is, a, the tax and spend, you know, no one likes to pay taxes, you know, first and foremost, myself included. But oftentimes, sometimes what the, uh, the government does in the tax and spend clause is they'll use it to assert their leverage and power on a, to get what they want. So we talked about this before, uh, how that the tax and spend clause is that they, they use it, you know, specifically a case out of Montana where the federal government would limit transportation funds unless they raise the drinking age to 21. Yes. And there's other cases that did the same thing. Uh, you know, we'll talk about those later on. But, uh, you know, in the United States versus Patskinski, the court allowed a tax exemption with a quasi-geographical in nature. In this case, oil was produced within a defined geographical re region above the Arctic Circle and was exempted from federal excise taxes on oil production. 
production. And the reason they did that is because they wanted more people to move to Alaska. <laughs> exactly. And, and so the government, you know, uses the tax and spending clause not only you know to raise revenue but also to enforce policy. Is that correct? Right. Well, again, to we go back to what Jefferson said basically, is that if you give a distinct and independent power to do any act that Congress pleases, which might be for the good of the Union, would render all the preceding and subsequent enumerations of power completely useless. I was struggling with my own words. I was looking for this quote and couldn't find it. But here again, he says, it would reduce the whole instrument to a single phrase, that of instituting a Congress with power to do whatever would be for the good of the United States, and as they would be the sole judges of the good or evil, it would also be a power to do whatever evil, evil they pleased. Wow, that's yeah. uh, cogent words right there. We're going to get more into this, you guys. We're talking the Tax and Spending Clause, the Commerce Clause, today on Richard Nixon Live, The Legal Lounge, broadcasting on CRN Digital Talk Radio. Stay with us. Any questions or concerns, give us a call, 818-818-6401, and we'll be right back right after the break. When you really want Italian food, you have got to get to Colombo's. Colombo's Italian Steakhouse and Jazz Club, Colorado Boulevard, Eagle Rock. It's that little neighborhood place you wish was down the street from you. What happened to summer? You turn around and it's gone. So what do you do? Solution. Either stop turning around or head on over to Colombo's and enjoy the most delicious steaks imaginable. Seafood that brings awe and wonderment to your happy little taste buds. Colombo family Italian recipes so special they're kept under lock and key at an undisclosed and secure location. Jazz every night and the world's greatest meatballs. Need I say more? Oh, but I will. Enjoy the summer and head on over to Colombo's Italian Steakhouse. Good time central. Colombo's, because it really is that little neighborhood place you wish was down the street from you. Colombo's Manja. The smartest way for you to get the lowest prices on your plane tickets, domestic or international, is to call SmartFares first or last, but you've got to call us before you book your plane tickets. Fly anywhere in the world, fly anywhere in the U.S., and SmartFares can save you up to 75% on your plane tickets. We have the lowest airline ticket prices on over 500 airlines, and you've got a great 12-hour free cancellation window. Plus, with our live agent help, you can always get fast help and fast answers. So on your next trip, maybe today, maybe tomorrow, how about right now? Pick up your phone and call SmartFares, plus save up to 75% on your plane reservation. So call right now. 800-915-2644. 800-915-2644. 800-915-2644. 800-915-2644. Still got those annoying critters? I'm talking bees and fleas, spiders, ants, roaches, bed bugs, and those disgusting rodents. Have you made that call to Dewey Pest Control yet? What's holding you back? Get rid of them, and I mean right now. When the heat brings them out, it's time to call Dewey, because Dewey knocks them down and keeps them out. Dewey's an 89-year Heritage California family business with 32 offices statewide. Think you got those 24-7 wood-munching termites chewing up your house? Call Dewey right now for their free inspection. And all this month, get $89 off with a regular maintenance program. Call 800-209-0900. That's 800-209-0900. Just one call to Dewey does it all. 800-209-0900. Or get your free inspection online at DeweyRadio.com. That's Dewey, D-E-W-E-Y, DeweyRadio.com. And 
glad we are back. Richard Nixon live in the legal lounge here on CRN Digital Talk Radio. We're having a good time here talking all things constitutional with noted author and attorney Richard Nixon. We're talking about Article 1, Section 8, Clause 1, the U.S. Constitution, the Tax and Spend Clause. And uh, Richard, uh, you brought to my attention that the founder of George Mason University, one yes. George Mason, excellent basketball uh, uh, program, he uh, actually would not vote to ratify the U.S. Constitution over this issue. That's right. And, you know, taxation was a very, very big issue uh, during the uh, convention, constitutional convention. Uh, as it turns out, the, the the federal government or the Constitution basically says there should be no direct taxation between the federal government and the people. And it was intended that only the states tax the people, and the states would submit money, their tax dollars, based on the population, to the federal government if and only if the state decided they liked what the federal government was doing. They were in charge. That, that put the states in charge of the federal government, at least indirectly, up until the 16th Amendment, where uh, because of the 16th Amendment, the federal government was able to tax directly the individuals. So it put pushed the states out of the way. But in, uh, in reference to what you're mentioning, Mike, uh, this is 1788. Now, this is a year before the ratification of the Constitution. It's on the subject of taxation, George Mason in 1788, in a speech to the Virginia Ratifying Convention, in opposition to ratification of the proposed Constitution, stated the following, the power to tax is calculated to annihilate totally the state governments. Will the people of this great community submit to being individually taxed by two different and distinct powers? Will they suffer themselves to be doubly harassed? These two concurrent powers cannot exist long together. The one will destroy the other, the general government being paramount to and in every respect more powerful than the state governments. The latter must give way to the former. So he was clear he would not ratify the Constitution because he could see prescience again that the federal government was eventually going to annihilate the states. And I'd suggest we're not far from it now. Because, like you said, Richard, just to back up for a second, the states levy their own taxes. Yes. The federal government levies their own taxes. Right. Income taxes, sales right. taxes, all different sorts of taxes, estate taxes. Right. And again, what's happened here, ironically, is the federal government has gotten so big in terms of its income vis-a-vis -vis taxes that it now doles not no time, pun intended, but the South Dakota versus Dole case is a good example of how the federal government has amassed so much money that it doles back money to the states based upon whether or not the states behaved with the current administration's federal policies. This is a an end run around for those f football fans out there. This is an end run around Article One, Section Eight, clauses one through eighteen, which limited expressly the power is granted to Congress. Yeah, it's using the power of the purse to control the states. Exactly. And to have the states do the federal government's bidding. Exactly. So again, um, as far as the uh, that situation, uh, the only other thing that came to pass was, as we could get into the South Dakota versus Dole case, uh, as we said, it was an end run around uh, Article One, Section 8, which I think most people will recall are the express powers that Congress was given by the Constitutional Convention. And furthermore, the, you know, most recently there's been a, you know, a case in the ACA. You know, there's, yes. there's a case involving the ACA where a particular state did not want to participate in the, the state exchanges, and the federal government said, hey, unless you participate <laughs> in, this, in the state exchanges, then we're going to deny you the Medicare funds that are exactly. out by the federal government. How is that constitutional? Well, I, I, people like myself say it is not constitutional yeah. because, again, it's going outside the clearly enumerated powers of the Constitution that was granted to Congress. But uh, the Supreme Court, in league with Congress, has simply said it's okay to do it. So uh, between those two, uh, all you've got is the president, and the president uh, can't really overrule uh, acts 
of the Supreme Court are acts of Congress. Yeah, and at the end of the show, we're going to talk solutions, you guys, so make sure to stick around for that. But speaking of enumerated power, we're going to talk about one of those enumerated powers, the Commerce Clause, when we come back right after the break. You guys stay with us. Your Article 1, Section 8, Clause 3, the Commerce Clause is on deck and ready to go. We're going to be discussing that right after the break. I'm with Richard Nixon. He's a noted attorney and author. America, Illusion of Freedom, available on Amazon.com, Barnes & Noble, and iTunes, you guys. Any questions or comments or concerns, uh, give us a call, 818-818-6401, and I'll be right back right after the break. This is today's entertainment answer. Did you know that Amazon Prime is not just for free shipping? I forget they have great movies too. This week, the Amazon Prime original video Jack Ryan, starring John Krasinski, releases. Marine-turned-rookie CIA analyst Jack Ryan becomes an unexpected hero as he races to stop the extremist from unleashing an insidious assault on U.S. soil. An action-packed thrill ride told in eight heart-stopping episodes. Jack Ryan available this week on Amazon Prime. For this entertainment answer, I'm Matt Mungle. Do you want to fly somewhere, anywhere in the world? Smart travelers call MyFlightSearch.com for the best deals on flight tickets. Going to Manila, Bangkok, London, how about Singapore? Call MyFlightSearch.com for the lowest flight tickets available. What about a local vacation? Let's say you want to fly to Vegas, Orlando, Miami, Los Angeles, or Denver. Pick up the phone and call MyFlightSearch.com right now. We have exclusive deals that you can't find anywhere else. The only way you can get these low airline prices is by calling us. We have so many low prices available, we can't possibly tell them to you right here and now. If you're flying somewhere anytime in the next six months and you want the lowest airline ticket prices anywhere, you owe it to yourself to save a ton of money. So pick up your cell phone and call MyFlightSearch.com right now. Call 800-445-3166. 800-445-3166. That's 800-445-3166. Call now. 800-445-3166. If Ernest Hemingway was alive today, would he say this to you? Shakespeare, Mark Twain, Edgar Allan Poe, all great writers. And after reading your book, I simply must add you to the list. Wait, you don't have a book yet. So make a free call to Page Publishing. Their expert staff can help you turn your book idea into a real book, a masterpiece that could someday make the bestseller list in hard copy and digitally all across the world. Page Publishing can help you completely take your idea for a book, write it, and publish it. So if you want to join the ranks of some of the most famous authors in the world, call now for a free information kit. Turn your book idea into publishing gold. Make a free call right now to Page Publishing. 800-378-3212. 800-378-3212. That's 800-378-3212. The following ad contains shocking material. Listener discretion is advised. Is someone in your family playing a dangerous game of Russian roulette? Over 43,000 people die a year from drug overdose. 120 people a day. Five people every hour. One person every 12 minutes. 88,000 people die every year from alcohol abuse. Over 240 people a day. 10 an hour. One person every six minutes. Somebody you know may be next. Learn how to help someone you love get away from the drug alcohol and bad influences with the FMLA people can take a leave of absence from their job and still keep it call quit drugs 321 now at 800-378-3315 800-378-3315 800-378-3315 that's 800-378-3315 you check things all the time, like your email every 10 seconds, or your ex's Instagram. But what about checking something as important as your credit? Well, Discover makes it quick, easy, and best of all, free. Discover is now offering FICO credit scores to everyone for free, even if you're not a customer. And checking your score won't hurt your credit. We call it the Discover Credit Scorecard. And once you know your score, you should check to see if your current credit card is the best fit for you. Check your credit, compare your card. Go to discover.com slash credit scorecard. Limitations apply.
Welcome back. Legal Lounge with Richard Nixon. CRN Digital Talk Radio streaming live coast to coast and around the world on CRNTalk.com. Give us a call, 818-818-6401. I'm joined by Richard Nixon. He's an author. He's an attorney. He's a constitutional scholar and author, America, An Illusion of Freedom. And we like to say this every week, you guys. Uh, if you served with Richard Nixon, if you personally knew Richard Nixon, during his time of service, 63 to 65, stateside, and 68 as a contractor in Vietnam, in country. If you guys knew him personally, give us a call. It's Connect the Vets. Uh, give us a call at 818-818-6400, and we'd love to connect with you and also provide you with a free copy of Richard's fantastic book, America, An Illusion of Freedom. Let's get right back into it. Commerce Clause. Yes, well, thank you for that, Mike. Um, Commerce Clause has to do, It's a, again, it's part of, Article 1, Section 8, it's Clause 3. And basically what it says is Congress shall have the power to regulate commerce with foreign nations and among the several states and with the Indian tribes. That seemed to be obvious, except the word regulate became a problem. What regulate meant historically was resolve disputes. It didn't really mean regulate. It didn't mean to get involved. It was not, never intended that the states excuse me, that the federal get involved with this, the operation of the states other than when the states had a dispute. And in fact, on that subject, James Madison, often referred to as the father of the Constitution, had this to say about the Commerce Clause. He said, it's very certain that the Commerce Clause grew out of an abuse of the power by the importing states in taxing the non-importing states and was intended as a negative and preventive provision against injustice among the states themselves, rather than as a power to be used for the positive purpose of the general government, in which alone, however, the remedial power could be lodged. That was a letter they sent to, to Cabell in February of 1829. So basically he was saying this is not a positive grant of power to the federal government simply, but simply a limitation on what the states could do, and the federal government was simply there to arbitrate or mediate, if you will. Yeah, I mean, it, like you said, it kind of started out about you know about importing states and non-importing states, but here comes our old friend, the Necessary and Proper Clause. Uh, but despite uh, disputes exist within the court as the range of powers granted to Congress by the Commerce Clause, but it's often paired with the Necessary and Proper Clause, and the combination is used to take a broad, expansive perspective, perspective of these powers. Broad and expansive. Yes, and of course it started off pretty much adhering to the text and the history of the Constitution. In fact, there's a case, U.S. versus Butler, 1937, that held that a tax enacted by the federal government for the purpose of reducing farm production of certain goods and payment of benefits for compliance was unconstitutional because it was not authorized by the so-called spending clause. That is to say, since farm production was strictly a in-state activity, there was no justification, at least under Article One, Section 8, as then understood, uh, for the federal government to tax for that purpose. But really the Commerce Clause became, you know, derogated during the, uh, the New Deal. During the New Deal, like, it, there was a lot of uh, legislation, so otherwise known as the Alphabet Soup Acts and Alphabet uh, Soup Agencies, yes. which used the Commerce Clause expansively to uh, really just broaden federal powers immensely under Roosevelt. And uh, there's a case that we just have to talk about that comes out of this. It's uh, Wickard versus Philborn. We've talked about this briefly before, but this is an absolutely amazing case. Can yes. you give, our, give our audience a little bit of background about this. Well, as time went on, the Supreme Court started to recognize uh, things that, even though something may have been done strictly within the state, that it might have some bearing or impact on interstate commerce. Uh, but still, the, the court was reluctant up until about 1940 or so to extend um, the federal government's authority to tax for something that was, if you will, homegrown. But in 1942, under the case of Wickard versus Filburn, the court actually held that even where farm production was intended wholly for consumption on the farm, it is subject to federal regulation since consumption get this, might reduce the demand for other commodities, which again might 
have an effect on interstate commerce. So we've got two mites there, that is to say two uh, intangibles, speculation, that because uh, Dad was raising a victory garden in his backyard, growing tomatoes, the fact that he was eating those tomatoes meant that he might not buy tomatoes from another state or another country and therefore it would affect interstate commerce and therefore the federal government control what dad did in his victory garden. That's absolutely insane to me. It I, is. Even if you come from the left, the right, the center, <laughs> wherever your political position is, your political ideology, this is absolutely insane that this farmer <laughs> You know, the, 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 we're the breadbasket of the world. Right. We grow more crops, more food than any other nation on earth back then and now. And so this, and they had victory gardens in the White House. Yes. It was considered a patriotic duty to grow your own food at that time because the more fo food you grew yourself on your own plot of land, the let more food we can send overseas to our boys. Exactly. And if you guys think that this, this precedent is, uh, you know, gone by the legal wayside, you are wrong, my friends. Most recently, uh, just recently in 2000, uh, 2000, where is it, 2012, in Gonzalez versus Raich, the Supreme Court used, cited this law as precedent when a, a, an individual wanted to grow medical marijuana in a state that where they have legalized medical marijuana. He wanted to grow that, and the, the Supreme Court ruled that he could not do that under the Commerce Clause. Even if no goods were sold or transported across state lines, the court found that there can be, quote, an indirect effect on interstate commerce by this yes, man. Absolutely. And it gets worse, if you will, because it appears that between 1937 and 1995, the Supreme Court upheld virtually every regulation of business enacted by Congress. So that meant no matter how deep Congress delved into the state's affairs, the Supreme Court was going to okay that. And uh, there's some limitation on that. Uh, we had the United States versus Lopez where they held that uh, federal law barring possession of a gun near a school zone was held unconstitutional. Yeah, I want to talk about that case after the break. You guys stick around. Short break. Two minutes. We'll be back. Legal Lounge. Richard Nixon. He's an attorney. He's an author. He's a scientist. He's a smartest guy I know. So we'll be right back, you guys. <laughs> Stay with us here. Richard Nixon live. Sierra Digital Talk Radio. What are you going to do with your old car? You can try selling it, you could junk it, or you could donate it to Heritage for the Blind. Your car will be towed away for free and your donation is tax deductible. Just call 1-800-785-9618. Heritage for the Blind accepts cars, vans, trucks, and boats. It doesn't matter if your vehicle runs or not. It will be towed away for free and you'll be supporting those that need help. Heritage for the Blind is a nonprofit organization that helps the visually impaired live fuller lives. Call right now to donate your car, and as a special thank you for calling, you'll receive a free three-day vacation voucher to many exciting locations. Call Heritage for the Blind right now, 1-800-785-9618. Donating is easy, and your vehicle is towed away for free. Plus, you'll get a free vacation voucher. Call now, 1-800-785-9618. That's 1-800-785-9618. The smartest way for you to get the lowest prices on your plane tickets, domestic or international, is to call SmartFares first or last, but you've got to call us before you book your plane tickets. Fly anywhere in the world, fly anywhere in the U.S., and SmartFares can save you up to 75% on your plane tickets. We have the lowest airline ticket prices on over 500 airlines, and you've got a great 12 12-hour free cancellation window. Plus, with our live agent help, you can always get fast help and fast answers. So on your next trip, maybe today, maybe tomorrow, how about right now? Pick up your phone and call SmartFares. Plus, save up to 75% on your plane reservation. So call right now. 800-915-2644. 800-915-2644. Eight hundred nine one five two six four four eight hundred nine one five twenty six forty four. And we are back. Richard Nixon live in the Legal Lounge, Sierra Digital Talk Radio. We finally got ourselves on Facebook, so check us out at facebook.com slash Sierra Talk. You can watch us there and also participate in the conversation. 
Also available on YouTube, just search Richard Nixon Live CRN Talk or CRN Talk or Richard Nixon, any of the combination. You can see us on YouTube at your leisure. Uh, let's get back to it. Commerce Clause. <laughs> You have me pulling my hair out over uh, that, <laughs> that, that last case, that Wickard versus Philborn is just absolutely insane. But there's another case that kind of talks about the, the Commerce Clause and the uh, federal powers, and it's uh, the United States versus Lopez. We teased it before the break. Uh, Richard, why don't you fill our audience in about that? Well, before we do that, Mike, I appreciate your reaction to Wickard versus Fulburn, Filburn. And this is one of the reasons why I wrote my book, because I thought if people, and I know 98% of the people in this country are not aware of these decisions, if they were, I think they would all have the same reaction you did. You just can't believe what our Supreme Court has done in, in league with Congress. And what it, they've effectively done is taken power from the people. And again, I'm not a flower child. I was not never a hippie when I was younger. <laughs> but power to the people makes sense in this context. Anyway... In U.S. versus Lopez, 1995, my boy Sirica came, not Sirica, Scalia, Scalia, excuse me, yeah. got the two Italians mixed up there. <laughs> the courthouse in invalid a federal statute barring possession of a gun in a school zone because such an act would be a criminal act not related to economics, therefore not a proper subject for the Commerce Clause. And again, I, no other argument is why do we need another federal law? We already have state laws outlawing guns in possession around school zones. So again, Scalia simply said that this was not a proper subject and therefore it was unconstitutional to have the federal law. And the, I mean, it's and also what just defies logic for me, just as a layman, um, you know, is that they use the Commerce Clause to support their argument about yes. this. I mean, the federal government can make a criminal law, any criminal law they want, but to make criminal law using the Commerce Clause in this particular case just doesn't make sense to me. Well, and there's another case again in 2000 in United States versus Morrison, the court held that invalid a Violence Against Women Act. A Women Act, which had, was intended to protect women against gender-based violence because it did not involve interstate commerce. The court also held that the Constitution distinguishes between national and local matters and that the police power, that is the general power to regulate health, safety, morals, and welfare, belongs to the states. Mm -hmm. So again, this has been misconstrued. It's been done by Biden, Senator, Vice President Biden, who said, well, those who rule against it are anti-women. No, that's not the case at all. It's a proper understanding of the Constitution and the fact that the states already protect women in these rape situations and so on. It should be noted, though, the, there has been some, you know, the, some cases recently that use the Commerce Clause in ways that really kind of you know, stretches the logic. But post uh, New Deal, post um, FDR, the Rehnquist Court was a little bit more uh, conservative, and I'm not using that word in the connotations that most people believe, more conservative when it comes to uh, applying the Commerce Clause to, uh, to settle law. Uh, it, Rehnquist explained that you know that the Commerce Clause is not an essential part of a larger regulation economic activity in which the regulatory scheme could undercut unless the interstate activities was were regulated. And once again, there's that word regulated. Yes. And Rehnquist, I believe, he he takes uh, your point of view that regulate really means only settle disputes rather than actually impose regulations. Exactly. Uh, but you see, what's happened is because that word regulation has been, again, I it's getting to be hackneyed, but because the Supreme Court has redefined another term, instead of going back to the words and the actual history to see what the word actually meant when it was written, they, after they're sure everybody that would know better is deceased, they redefine the term. In this case, again, in order to extend the power of the federal government over the people, uh, they redefined the terms, and now they've gotten into almost everything. Everything, uh, I'm exaggerating just a bit, but the, the number of regulations and federal laws regarding our everyday lives has increased exponentially because of this redefe redefinition of terms. And the Commerce Clause, the, the Tax and Spend Clause are two of the biggest 
violators. Yeah, I mean, I got to give a shout out to the great uh, journalist, polyglot, and linguist Barry Farber, who's on our show right after this. That you know, there's a, a term in communication that's known as uh, the uh, the reference, the uh, representation is not the same as the referent, and I think the the court does the same thing, meaning that yes. they can stretch language that will go far beyond what the actual referring to the language is, and they can do really whatever they want. And this kind of just speaks to the general theme, not only of uh, your book but also the show, is that. Supreme Court, not only they rewrote the Equal Protection Clause to suitify their, their benefit, they rewrote the Due Process Clause and they rewrote the Commerce Clause and the Tax, tax and Spend Clause to consolidate federal power. Is that correct? It is. But one other thing, Mike, that I want to say, and it's, we've said this before and I'd like to say it again. If I'm running out of time, let me know, Mike. Uh, this is what all judges, justices, and attorneys know to be true. And that is... Their fundamental task in construing a statute is to ascertain the legislative intent so as to effectuate the purpose of the law. That is, what I'm trying to say there is strictly, it's not a judge's role to rewrite the law. It's to do what the judges determined the legislature meant to be the purpose of the law. And that's what they're supposed to do. Somehow the Supreme Court has exempted itself from those rules. Exempted themselves and the legislative branch has exempted themselves from their own responsibility <laughs> exactly. as servants of the people as well. Because like we said, almost every episode, and it's just so apparent that it's become more politically expedient for Congress people to let the Supreme Court handle these issues rather than make laws themselves because they can be voted out. You guys stick around. We'll be back. back. We're going to talk solutions here on Richard Nixon Live, Legal Lounge, CRN Digital Talk Radio. We'll be right back. Still got those annoying critters? I'm talking bees and fleas, spiders, ants, roaches, bed bugs, and those disgusting rodents. Have you made that call to Dewey Pest Control yet? What's holding you back? Get rid of them, and I mean right now. When the heat brings them out, it's time to call Dewey, because Dewey knocks them down and keeps them out. Dewey's an 89-year Heritage California family business with 32 offices statewide. Think you got those 24-7 wood-munching term mites chewing up your house? Call Dewey right now for their free inspection. And all this month, get $89 off with a regular maintenance program. Call 800-209-0900. That's 800-209-0900. Just one call to Dewey does it all. 800-209-0900. Or get your free inspection online at DeweyRadio.com. That's Dewey, D-E-W-E-Y, DeweyRadio.com. Do you owe back taxes to the IRS? News flash: the president has changed the tax laws, and now you may be able to pay the IRS less. If you owe $10,000 or more in back taxes, the tax doctor can help you pay the IRS as little as possible allowed by law. There are new tax laws for business owners, the self-employed, even W-2 workers. If you have a back tax problem or a few years of unfilled returns, new help to save you money is now here. Call right now to see how the new tax Tax laws can help you. Plus, right now, we'll waive the consultation fee and give you a free tax savings report. Attention business owners, the self-employed, and W-2 workers. Make this free call to the tax doctor now and learn how to take advantage of the new tax laws that may help you pay the IRS less. 800-985-1610. 800-985-1610. That's 800-985-1610. You order a glass of your favorite Cabernet, fresh asparagus, hollandaise on the side, a filet, medium rare. You unfurl your napkin with a flare, close your eyes, and prepare to listen. Ah, there it is. The sweet music you long to hear. The sizzle. The sizzle of a Ruth's Chris steak. The most magnificent corn-fed prime beef broiled to perfection at 1,800 degrees. Some call it a sizzle. We call it an anthem. As the waiter approaches, you think, is this one mine or that one? Ruth's Chris Steakhouse. Like Ruth always said, life's too short to eat anywhere else. Make a reservation online at RuthsChris.com or by calling 800-544-0808. And 
We are back. Richard Nixon live wrapping things up here on CRN Digital Talk Radio, crntalk.com, facebook.com slash CRN Talk. And we today we had, we just, whew, we got after it today, you guys. We talked about the Commerce Clause. We talked about the Tax and Spend Clause in this insane case. Wickard versus Philborn. Just, I, I go on YouTube, you guys, and look at some of these arguments about Wickard, Wickard versus Philborn. Read up about it. It's an amazing case, and it's absolutely insane. But we're going to talk about solutions, you guys. We always like to talk about solutions, and there's plenty of solutions outlined in Richard's book, America, an Illusion of Freedom. And no matter, no matter where you stand on these issues, right, left, or center, the process needs to be respected. The founders set this government up to have checks and balances on equal branches. Yes. And what happens now is that the Supreme Court has become supreme to the other two branches. Exactly. And uh, so what do we do here, Richard? Well, as we said, this started back in 1803, frankly, and it's uh, only amplified since. Uh, what I suggest in my book, in Chapter 8 of my book, and this is only a suggestion, in other words, these words are not cast in stone, but what I say regarding the resolution for the Commerce Clause and the Tax and Spend Clause is the following. Neither the Supreme Court nor any inferior federal court ordained or established by Congress under Article Three of the U.S. Constitution shall have jurisdiction to hear matters involving that portion of the Commerce Clause, that is, commerce between the states, in any matter unless said matter involves a bona fide dispute or disputes between two or more states. And I say the same thing. Uh, regarding the tax and spend clause. So again, there is room to do it. We we can Congress could pass that resolution tomorrow, and if the president signed it, that would limit the use of the commerce clause, and Congress th could then only pass laws dealing with resolutions of conflicts between the states, rather than Congress literally regulating everything that's done within the states. Using the Commerce Clause as the apropos language to yes. do so. Now, uh, Mike, I don't know if we have time, but if we do, I'd like to quote our boy Thomas Jefferson. Yeah. Excuse me. No, no, I'm sorry. I was going to say another boy, George Washington. In 1796, in his farewell address, he had a few words to say about amending the Constitution. It is important, likewise, that the habits of thinking in a free country should inspire caution in those entrusted with its administration to confine themselves within their respective constitutional spheres, avoiding in the exercise of powers of one department to encroach upon another. The spirit of encroachment tends to consolidate the powers of all the departments in one and thus to create, whatever the form of government, a real despotism. A just estimate of that love of power and proneness to abuse in which predominates in the human heart is sufficient to satisfy us of the truth of this position. The necessity of reciprocal checks in the exercise of political power by dividing and distributing it into different depositories and constituting such each the guardian of the public wheel against invasions by the others has been evinced by experiments ancient and modern some of them in our country and others uh, elsewhere. To preserve them must be the necessary as to institute them if, in the opinion of the people, the distribution or modification of the constitutional powers be in any particular wrong, let it be corrected by amendments in the way that the Constitution designates. Amazing. I, mean, I can understand why they wanted to make that man king. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and it's amazing that this was written in 1796. Absolutely, you guys. Thank you so much for joining us. Richard Nixon and I am Mike Gary. This is CRN Digital Talk Radio. We are here every Tuesday at 4 p.m. Pacific Time, 7 p.m. Eastern Time. All past episodes available on our podcast app as well on YouTube. Just search Richard Nixon Live on YouTube. We'll be back next week. Richard, thank you so much. You're so welcome. I'm going to have to get some new glasses, I think, Mike. <laughs> you did, yeah. <laughs> All right, you guys. We'll be right back. We'll be back next week, you guys. Thank you so much for joining us. Richard Nixon Live, CRN Digital Talk Radio, broadcasting coast to coast and around the world. See you next which is most important because that was your theme. Are you tired of hearing your favorite talk radio show sound like this? What if you could hear your favorite shows in crystal clear, high definition digital sound?